How many of you are in the dating scene? I just got to tell you, I count my blessings that I no longer have to search for that special person. And I'm beyond blessed that God has given me a wife who shows me grace and who loves me even with all of my problems and my sin. But the dating scene is tough. And not only is it becoming increasingly more difficult to meet people naturally instead of through a dating app, but it is also becoming increasingly difficult to know what someone's intentions are. See, when me and Caroline were dating, I told her I liked her. And then she said, I'm not kidding. Okay. What does that mean? Does she like me back? Was she not into me? Did she not want to keep talking and dating? See, I don't know why, but she did continue to talk to me. And then I asked her if she wanted to be my girlfriend and she gave me a high five. And I thought I would have at least gotten a hug. I mean, I'm mentioning these things because dating is confusing. And it's hard to know the intentions of the other person. It's difficult to know who they truly are and what they are after. What I do know is that Caroline and I's intentions were to find a partner that would push us to draw closer to God, to get closer to his word and to grow in our faith and maturity. That can feel almost impossible to find someone like that in life, someone who is dating for the right reasons. The reality is that a majority of people date for fun, meaning for their pleasure, or whether or not we want to admit it, many can go into dating asking, what do I get out of this? Rather than what can I bring to this? Many are looking for samples without ever wanting to eat a real meal. Many people's intentions in dating are to just have fun. And many people intend to just do what everyone else does. Date until you find exactly what you want. See, because the thought goes that if I try everything out first, then I will know more clearly what I want. But those people are wrong. See, as we expand our desire, we're only complicating what we want. Now, life, dating, and our faith are all about the intentions behind what we are doing. And if you're dating with the intention of marriage, you're dating in the way God has created it to be. If you're dating to have fun with no real intention, then you're only hurting a lot of people on your path to finding the one. Now, at this point, you've got to be asking, Noah, why are we talking so much about dating? Well, it's because I believe it is one of the clearest ways to address our topic today. See, we want to talk about the intentions behind the actions because your intention matters much more than the size, amount, or effort your action takes. Today, we're talking about intentions because your intentions have one of the greatest effects on living the good life. But why do we need to talk about intentions? Well, because we are in a series. We're calling it The Good Life, and we're taking a look at what it means to live a life of generosity, not just in some areas, but in all areas of our life. And today, we're going to talk about helpful metrics for saving and tithing, all within that lens of your intentions. So let me just ask you, who's ever saved up for something? I remember as a kid saving up for my first iPod Nano and this thing was bright orange and I thought it was so cool because you could put all of your music on it and you could even play a couple games on it and I put all of my favorite music on that thing and man, I would just love to rock out to all the latest music I had. But I remember more than the iPod itself was the effort, the time and patience it took me to save up for that iPod. See, because I had to save all of my birth money, birthday money, not birth money, birthday money, and Christmas money to buy it. And now for a 12-year-old kid, that's kind of a tough thing to do because it took up passing up some awesome toys, some awesome Nerf guns, and some amazing video games. It took the sacrifice of other things I wanted because what I was wanted was going to take time and it was going to mean I was saving. See, saving money in life is not only just helpful for you, but it's also proof that you don't just look at money as something that comes and goes. It shows that you understand that what you make, no matter how little or how much, is a gift from God. It is a way that He provides for me. See, our first point is that saving rightly values money as a gift from God. What I mean by that, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6, 8 says, Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. See, the ant, it has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. What the author of Proverbs is trying to tell us is a helpful metric in understanding what it means to save. 
See, because one of the most helpful metrics we use for saving and tithing today is what we call the 10, 10, 80 rule. And I just want to be clear, while we believe this to be a very helpful metric for financial stability and financial generosity, it's not something we find at the point to be necessary for you to have faith and salvation in Jesus Christ. But, there's always a but, God does call us to be generous. And he calls us to be good stewards of what we have been given. And so if we just connect the dots real quickly, that means I should be generous with my money and I should be smart with my money. And so see, savings gives you opportunities to be more generous to others, to more generous to your kids, to create better opportunities for you to be generous for the rest of your life. Saving should come from a heart that wants to be generous. But this is where I have to stop and I have to ask, why do we save? Why do we invest? Why do we get into things like cryptocurrency and look for ways to make more money in our life? And the question that I hope can be a guiding factor for you today is what are my intentions? What do I want to do with more money and how will I use it? See, if you want to save so that you can provide your kids an education, so that they could use their God-given gifts, that's amazing. If you want to save so that you could renovate that old kitchen or that living room, so that you could host and welcome more people into your house, then praise God. But if you want to save just so that you only need to rely on yourself in every circumstance, if, if you save so that you can get all of the things you've ever desired, if you save to have more for yourself, Friends, I just need to be brutally honest with you. Those intentions are wrong. See, even in saving, our intentions should be opportunities to be more generous, freeing ourselves to give more, to love more, and to serve more. And so we remind ourselves that saving rightly values money as a gift from God. And so I would encourage you to find a way to put 10% of what you have made back into savings. Maybe it's in a retirement fund, maybe it's in other investments, but whatever you do, make sure that you are saving to be more generous in your life. Many people today are just saving to be more selfish. They're saving just to enjoy more, to have greater pleasure for themselves. And I would just ask you to consider how in every upgrade, in every financial decision, you ask, how can we use this to be more generous to those around us? How can we use this as an opportunity to show Christ's love and generosity to our neighbors, friends, and family? And that doesn't mean you can't have fun. It just means that you're looking at every opportunity and asking, how can I be more generous? And now I said 10, 10, 80. And so you might be asking, no, well, what is the other 10? Our first 10 is 10% of our money goes into savings. Well, what's the other 10? Well, that's what we call a tithe. And now where do we get this word tithe from? Well, it's a word that we actually see referenced in Scripture to the believers in the Old Testament. And the meaning of the word tithe is truthfully one-tenth. And so now you know why we say 10%, because that's what the word itself means. But more importantly, a tithe that serves two very important purposes in your life. First, it helps support the local and global church. It helps us do things like this. It helps our church reach out to the community. It helps our church operate and love on other people. And so we would encourage you to be a regular, consistent tither wherever you consider being your home church. But the second purpose, and the most important purpose of tithing, is that tithing rightly values money as a gift from God. See what I did there? Saving rightly values money as a gift from God. Tithing also rightly values money as a gift from God. And if we know who it is from, then we should give it back to his mission. See, the money we earn, the money we make, we cannot continue to just live our lives and look at it as ours. We must recognize that this money came from God, right? That he has given me the gifts to work, to get paid and to earn a wage. And because of God's generosity, because of who he is, I should give back to the mission. I should give back to the church locally and globally because they're trying to accomplish something. They're trying to save lost souls. And so we tithe, not because we have to, but because we should want to. I remember when I went to summer camp in middle school, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. They had a zip line, they had a blob which launched you into the air, into the water, and they even had horseback riding. 
They also had a specific time every day when you would go and get snacks from the snack shack. And now there was one big stipulation on the snack shack. Your parents, they had to load your account with money for snacks or else you couldn't get any. And now my parents, they put money in my account so that I could get snacks. But there was a kid I was starting to become friends with and he did not have that same opportunity. And so for me, I, I bought him a snack with my money. And I remember I got both of us airheads and I just thought it was the coolest, tastiest thing ever as a middle schooler. And friends, here's what I'm trying to illustrate. I didn't give him that candy because I knew he would pay me back. I didn't give him that candy because I thought I was getting something in return. I gave him it because I wanted to. Nobody told me I had to and nobody told me it was necessary but it was so much better to share what I had with someone else rather than just storing it up all for myself. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, I know some people may have already written this message off, and I get it, we're human, and for some reason, whenever we start talking about money, we just tend to respond in offended ways, in hurtful ways, and sometimes we even get angry. Here's what I just want you to know. I have been there. I have gotten angry. I have gotten frustrated. And for the longest time in my life, I did not give a single penny back to God. I just didn't. I told myself that I could tithe to him in other ways. I would tithe through my time and through my talents, but never my treasure. Well, something changed in me, and I want to tell you what, but first, I want to read a passage of scripture with you that has been on my heart. This chapter in Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 37. Some of you may have heard it, but I just want to read it. And it says, No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And, and no one after drinking old wine wants a new, for they say the old is better. Now here is what was happening in this passage. Jesus and his disciples were living against some of the common traditions and religions of old covenant believers at the time. And so Jesus, he began to share with them in a parable form how he was sent to bring about a new covenant, a new way of living. And that way of living is a life of generosity to those we love, to those we hate, and to those we don't even know. Jesus shared this parable, which would have been so obviously understood in that time, but for us today, we're just like, what are wineskins? Well, let me explain a little bit. At that time, to help with the fermentation process of wine, they would put the wine into a sewn-up goatskin. Yes, you heard that right. And the only problem is that because of the process and the acidic nature of fermentation, a wineskin would only be good for one-time use. See, because if it got used again, it would truthfully leak out. See, whatever was poured in because the skin had been so weakened by all of these things, it would just leak. And so why am I mentioning this? Because the story gets back to the heart of the matter. It gets back to the intentions. See, old wineskin, it represents someone who has not given up the ways of the world for God's ways. See, they may have new wine poured into them, But that new wine is not lasting. It is not changing them because they have not changed their ways. This new wine is the new covenant Jesus Christ brought when he died on the cross for our sins. This new wine is the freedom we can experience when we live the good life and when we live a life of generosity. So right now, I just want to ask you, what are you? Is your life living out the values and word of Jesus Christ? Or are you taking the advice of this world for your finances but listening to Jesus about the spiritual stuff. Are you storing treasure on earth or in heaven? We just must not continue to live a life that pretends to be Christ-like, but knowingly chooses the ways of the world over God's. Jesus tells us to be cheerful givers, to give whatever our heart has decided to give, not under any compulsion. So I don't stand here telling you, you must tithe or telling you, you must save. I stand here encouraging you in the new covenant, the new wineskin, in the way God has taught us to handle our savings, to handle our tithing. Now, what about the rest of the story of my story that I didn't finish? Well, let me tell you, for my whole life, I had never given any money to God. 
I didn't tithe at the church. I even used to work at it in Maryland because I told myself, I have way too much college debt. I could never give any more money. And then I moved to the point, and my heart was still filled with this viewpoint that I didn't have enough money to give. Slowly God was working on me, and he said, no, you should start giving, but I still could tell myself, I still was convincing myself, I just have too many bills. I just have too many things going in my life I cannot give don't have enough money to give. I knew God is gracious. I knew that I was still saved regardless of my giving. But God, he started to do a work in me. He started to share with me what I'm trying to share with you today. See, I'm filled. I am filled with debt from college. I'm filled with debt from a house and a house payment. I have multiple payments every month that just seem to keep coming. And I have a kid who goes through diapers. We're trying to get him off of it so we could save a little money there. And so I, in my whole life, said there was no way I could just give up 10% of that and still live and still survive. And yet, friends, I am standing here today as a testimony to God's provision when I choose to be faithful to Him. When I choose to look at money as a gift from God, and then I start to trust God more with that money than myself. Giving a tithe, it is so much more about your heart than it is about any money. See, savings should be about so much more than just storing up a treasure for yourself. If you want to live the good life, then it means not getting everything you ever wanted. If you want to experience a good life, it means giving everything you have up to God and asking Him how can I use my opportunities to share your truth? How can I use my time, my forgiveness, my money, and my talents to show generosity to this world? Now, we talk about these wineskins, but I just knew it wouldn't fully make a lot of sense. So I've got an illustration for you guys today. I hope it makes a little bit of sense. But we talked about this old wineskin. And it's this cup, and it, it, this cup is meant to hold water. But there is one big problem. I poked a bunch of holes in this water, okay? And so there's a problem there. If you know, when I grab this water jug and I pour water into here, we are going to see water leaking out of it. And it's just going to keep going. And this, this is the old wineskin that is talked about in the verse previously. See, because... God's covenant, his good ways, his right ways, he's trying to pour into us. We're, we're maybe even coming to church. We're trying to listen. We're trying to take in what he has to say, but we're continuing to live in our old ways that will just leak out the truth that God is trying to share with us. See, in our life, there are so many things that are trying to tell us, this is how you should live. This is how you should save. This is how you should give. Store up things for yourself. Store up wealth for yourself. Store up fame for yourself. Store up things for you. And God is just telling us, he's like, why are you listening to the world when I have given you everything you need? I have told you, I have given you a book that says, this is how you should live. This is how you should give. This is how you should save. Why do you continue to listen to this world over me? So what I would encourage you to be is that new wineskin. I would encourage you to change your ways so that as Christ's truth, as his new covenant, as his word comes into your life, that it will not just leak out, but that it will stay there. Friends, I know that this may be a simple illustration. I know this may be a silly illustration. But I want you to understand that if we continue to live out our lives, living this double life, right, where some of the things in my life I will give to God, but some of them I will not, right, that I continue to trust the world for how I make financial decisions over God's word, I just got to say, you're not going to hold those truths very firmly. Because you're still living in the old wineskin. And so I encourage you to change your ways and to trust God entirely with these things in your life. Because when you do, that truth stays with you. That hope and that word, it remains in you. And that is when you can see something come from it. That is when you can see God working in your life. See, in order to live the good life, we have to be all in. So I just want to reiterate, give what you can. 
I, we talked about 10, 10, 80. Give 10%. Save 10% and live off of 80%. That's a really helpful metric. If you're looking for a metric in your life of how I can give, how I can save, and what I should live off of, that's an amazing metric to work off of. What I would also encourage you is if you feel like you can never give that much, then just give what you can. Give from a heart that wants to rather than a heart that feels they have to. God's not after your money. He's after your heart. And he knows that if my heart is entirely focused on my money, if I can never give it up, if I can never let go of it, then money is my God, not God. And God should always be the one whom we put our trust in. God should be the one whom we put our trust with our money, our life, our savings, our family, our everything. We should trust him with it. See, God is faithful to provide for us everything that we need. And so I just, I want you to hear on this. I'm going to end on this main point. Your intentions, they reveal where your heart is. So, so would you guys just pray with me right now? Father God, I know that the message I have given today is not one that everybody is just excited to hear. God, I also think of the people in our church. I think of the people who are so joyful about their giving, who are so joyful about the opportunities you have given them to love more, to serve more, and to give more. God, would you just challenge us? Would you challenge my heart? Would you challenge their heart to look at how could their intentions, how could their actions from their intentions lead closer to you? I don't want to keep living in the world's ways. I don't want to keep listening to how the world says I need to save, to tell the world says what I need to do with my money. God, I want to listen to you. And so would you just help us? Would you help us have a humble heart? Would you help us have a heart that is willing to hear this, willing to listen to this, and willing to learn from this? God, I in no way am a financial guru up here. God, I don't want people to trust me, but I do want people to trust you. I want them to take what you have said in your word. I want them to look at your word and understand what you have said, what it means to live the good life, what it means to be generous. And I want that to be the way they live their life. So God, you have so graciously shown us what it means to be generous. You sent your son down here on this earth. You knew you were sacrificing him. You were giving him up to die so that you could so graciously give us the opportunity to have salvation, the opportunity to know you and to be with you for eternity in heaven. God, without you, without your sacrifice, without your generosity of your son, we would be and we would have earned, and we did earn, hell. So I pray right now for people who do not know you. I pray for those who are still trying to figure out, I'm living in my old ways. I'm trying to follow you. Why isn't it working? God, could you, can, could you move them? Could you push them? Could you challenge them to live in your new ways, in your new life, in your new truth? Because we know for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. We know that the wages of sin is death, but that your free gift that you so freely offer to us, that that free gift of God is eternal life in heaven with you. And that in order to get that, that we just have to confess with our mouth that you are Lord and believe in our heart that you rose from the dead and we will be saved. And so I pray for those who are struggling in their life to be generous. I pray for those who are struggling in their life to feel that they could never be more generous. God, that you would do a work in them, that you would, you would help them, that you would love them, that you would show them, hey, it's not about your money. It's about your heart. It's about your intentions. That's what I'm looking at. So God, would you just help us all this week to look at our intentions, to look at our heart, and see how we could live this good life, how we could be more generous to you, God. Thank you for who you are. And may we never forget what you did on that cross for us. In your wonderful and powerful name, amen. Hey there, thank you 
you so much for watching and checking us out. Hey, I want you to know we go live every Sunday, 9, 10, 15, and 11, 30. So I would love for you to like and subscribe to make sure that we can stay connected together all the time. I'll see you next time. Bye.